by the time we made it to the hotel, I still didn't consider that he was in that dire of need, and either did he, except that when I tried to get him from the car to the ho- to the room, he almost didn't make it. Hey everyone, this is Becky. And I'm Angie. And welcome to Real Talk with Becky and Angie. Hi, Becky. Hi, Angie. How are you? <laughs> Long time no see. It has been a while. I have not been ignoring you. In fact, truth is, well, actually, I've been ignoring you and the rest of the world, honestly. So I hope you understand. Always. Absolutely. And I have not been ignoring you either. I am like been had my head down and I'm getting stuff done. It's been good. You are. You yeah. are getting so much done. Well, I can't wait to hear what you're getting done. But first, I have to tell you, my dad moved in with me. Wow. When did that happen? <laughs> uh, Thursday officially. So, uh, uh, yeah, now I have my dad living here. So I get to experience that part of my life of having caretaking of my father. My dad's 90 and has an artificial heart. So um, it's, it's an interesting experience. But, yeah. That's where I'm at in life. So thought today maybe we could talk about that kind of that sandwich generation that I find myself in. Actually, I'm not really in that part because my daughter is grown and I have the grandkids, but I now have my dad living with me. And so that is a whole new experience that um, literally happened within about 72 hours. Wow. If that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, and and just in case our viewers don't know our logistics, dad lives in Northern California. Angie lives in Texas. So it wasn't like dad just was down the street and said, come on, move in. Yeah. It was quite an experience as a recap. Yes. As Becky was saying, my, I'm from Northern California and that's where my parents have lived ever since I left. And I live in Dallas, Fort Worth. It's about two weeks ago. I found out my dad was in the hospital and he could not go back home. And because of his heart and his device that keeps his heart pumping, there wasn't a place for him to go. There's no long-term care or, you know, facility like that. So they called me and said, can your dad come live with you? They being the medical team at UC Davis said, can your dad come live with you? (laughs) Like, yes. And they said, okay, well, we're going to find a temporary place because they could find a temporary place for him kind of like a rehab till I could get out there. And I said, I'll be there tomorrow. And so wow. I booked a trip of one way. Yeah. I less than 10 hours. I made it to Sacramento, rented a car, was at UC Davis, got trained on how to care for my dad. I had tests and I had all kinds of things. Um, and then by Friday at 8 PM, we checked out, went up to Chico and packed all of his items. We had family and friends that came and helped us pack. And so my dad and I took off in this SUV, the biggest SUV I could find, which wasn't very big, um, with oxygen and all kinds of things. And yeah, we set out for, for Dallas, Fort Worth. It was about four days and no joke in, um, in Flagstaff, we both thought I was going to, he we, he was going to, I thought I was going to lose him. He didn't think he was going to make it. And, wow. um, it was scary. What, it was scary. There was so much. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> my dad has never been on oxygen. And one of the criteria for him to get out of the hospital, which actually delayed us a day was to find oxygen tanks for him. And then a, um, concentrator, And I was calling everywhere. I was trying to find him because they're in short supply these days. And so finally, um, Friday afternoon, this big guy comes in with all these tanks of oxygen into my dad's hospital room and a um, concentrator. And that was our get out of UC Davis ticket. And we grabbed that and we took off. And um, But it was mostly as a backup because he needs it a little bit when he sleeps. I mean, he barely, barely failed the test that they give. And at one point we were, I had actually ordered a concentrator to be sent to a friend's house in Chico that I was going to pick up on Sunday before we hit the road. 
Anyway, he comes in, my savior guy comes in with, and he was really big and cute, by the way. He comes in with these oxygen tanks and everything. And uh, I get trained in those. And then we hit the road. And um, so what happened was, I got to I, I do not disturb here because this is a really important story. Um, he, as we're in Flagstaff, getting into Flagstaff, I didn't take into consideration that the altitude and although altitudes never really bothered me and it didn't didn't fa- you know i didn't i didn't take into consideration that he would be sucking more oxygen and when we were going into flagstaff he ran out of oxygen and by the time we made it to the hotel i still didn't consider that he was in that dire of need and either did he except that when I tried to get him from the car to the ho- to the room, he almost didn't make it. And oh gosh, I had him in a walker seat pushing him. And he's, you know, he's not a, it's not a big guy, but he's, you know, bigger than me. And so I got him into the room and he had to go to the bathroom and he tried to stand up and he wasn't standing up and he wasn't responding. And I got him to put his arms around my neck to stand him up. It was the only way I could get him up. And um, yeah, and long story short, as soon as I could get him to the bathroom, which was something we wanted to avoid. And these are the things I would want to share as, as, a, as, a, as a child, as the daughter of your parents, you start experiencing things you never thought you were going to experience with your parents and a, a thing that we didn't want to experience you know either but he wasn't quite coherent and i was in just crisis mode like i need to get my dad taken care of and um so i got him taken care of and got him over to the bed and got him on oxygen and you know once he got some oxygen he started coming around um but he said that night he prayed to god and said is this my time? Am I supposed to do this? Am I supposed to go? And he said, he's never had that. He's never done that before. He's never prayed quite like that. He said, and, um, God said, it's not his time. Mm -hmm. So we agreed. He keeps moving forward. And that was just a blip and he made it through, but it was Becky. It was, (laughs) it was scary as hell. Let me just say I was scared. And I, it takes a lot for me to just be scared. Um, cause not everything flashed in my mind. Like, is my dad going to die in a hotel bathroom in Flagstaff? Like this is no, <laughs> this is no, we're not doing this now. Um, so the whole time I was on the road with my dad, it was juggling his, see my dad hooks into, and I've said this before, but he hooks into electricity at night to keep his heart going. And then during the day he's on batteries. And there's a fine balance of how long he can be on batteries and how long he can, you know, or he, or he can be plugged in indefinitely as long as there's power. Um, so managing. I'm curious about that. Does he have like a co- mm-hmm. an exterior cord that plugs in? Yeah, yeah. So wow. that was part of that was part of my certification and stuff. As I have to clean his and change his dressing, where he has a tube that runs into his stomach basically, and it winds up to it goes up to his heart. And in there is all of the wires and everything that it's a heart pump. And so it keeps the pump, the blood pumping through his heart. And so he wears a little computer, basically like a little computer on the front of him. That's what actually powers the pump. That's the computer, you know, monitor thing. And then he has two batteries that he wears like holsters Mm. and those power it. So he's, he's loaded with, a battery, two batteries, and then a computer on his stomach with this cord running into his, up into his heart. So yeah, I've been changing his bandit or his um, port, they call it. And, and plus he's diabetic, but I'm starting to question his need because he's been with me now for two weeks and his insulin intake is way down. Um, He hasn't really been needing the oxygen except to sleep. There's been some changes just in the short amount of time he's been with me. So, um, you know, I think it's a good lifestyle change for him because I'm also not like, okay, dad, you can sit in your chair all day and do nothing. (laughs) It's just not, it's not who I am. So 
it's been it's been an experience and um what little we were able to get quickly to of his belongings um i'm grateful we're grateful we grateful we got what we could get and to get him on the road and get him out here and i have the perfect place for him so he's set up and getting used to us and we're getting used to him it's it's going to be an interesting and if you know if you remember my dad Becky he's super easy yeah yeah He's such a good guy and he's such a big heart and I can communicate with them. And I think that's so important because we're setting boundaries. Like he needs his boundaries and I need mine. Um, he wants to turn the TV up to 70, but he has hearing aids. So I'm like, Hey dad, I can't turn my hearing down, but you can turn yours up. Could we compromise here? So we figured that out. Um, we figured out like, if I'm going to go check on him, if he, you know, in his room, I look for where his electrical cord or his cord is. So I know if he's in the bathroom to not bother him. Uh -huh. <laughs> so there's just little things that we're working on and, um, you know, just communication. He said, you're always busy. And I said, don't, I am always busy, but never too busy for you. So if you need something, just get my attention, you know, because I'm, I always have something going on, but it's not more important than him. And I'm learning how to balance getting his needs taken care of, making sure he has the food he likes, um, and, you know, just, just change. It's a lifestyle change for sure. And then throw Jake in the middle of it. Bless his heart. You know, he's, he said that he knew he'd all, he had signed up for this early on. He figured this would probably happen or some variation of this at some point. So he's been really good. Well, Bless Jake is a kind, compassionate man. I can't see him being anything other than welcoming. And yeah. and how can I help? Exactly. They they watched they watched old westerns last night while I was working on a, a video, um, and it was so cute that they were down there just watching videos together or watching um, westerns together. I was like, this is perfect. This is kind of how I saw it going, uh -huh. and. Um, yeah, we're, yeah. my dad made it outside yesterday. We went and ran errands today. This is a big deal for my dad because mm -hmm. he's been in compromised health for a while. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, he's building up his strength and he's proud of himself. And you know what he told me that made so much, made me feel good? Is he said, I like the way you're encouraging. Oh, oh. It, that says so much. It says one that he needs it and wants it mm -hmm. and no one's done that for him. And, and your style is he loves it and welcomes it. That sounds like yeah. he's saying, thank you. Another thing that I've learned, and I'm just going to throw this in here because it's top of mind is, um, I heard this a long time ago. One of the things that the elderly say that they miss most is human touch mm -hmm. because they're separated. They become separated from their family, their significant others. Maybe one's passed away. Um, but they don't get that touch, the hugs, a lot of times they're frail and fragile. And a lot of times we're, we're afraid to hug the elder, you know, like, Oh my God, am I going to break up? I'm thinking you of know? my 96 year old mother-in-law when I hug her, she's just like these bones. And I just like, so yeah. Gentle. You just Like touch, tap, tap, uh, tap. Yeah. yeah. It's that, I know what you mean. I totally know. And my dad's a stout guy. He still has all his hair. Like I washed his hair yesterday. That's impressive. That's impressive. Jerry, I'm go like, Jerry. <laughs> But my dad, like yesterday I went by because I said I washed his hair and then he had like this little tuft sticking up and I just pushed it down and he, he just like, oh, and I just oh, stood there for a second oh. and I just rubbed his head. You know, it's just those things yeah. that I'm realizing that make such a big difference. Like I could have the perfect house. I could set up the perfect room for him. He could have the best quality sheets. None of that matters. Come by and just pat him on the back, rub his back a little bit, hold his hand, brush his hair. I mean, and make sure he's got a remote that goes to a hundred and we're good. I remember <laughs> good. when we were kids and your, and I know your dad probably still does it. He would mute during the commercials and it would be like, well, how do you know when the commercial's over? And like for years, I thought about him every time a commercial came out, I'm like, Aww. Jerry would mute it right now. He mutes him. Yeah. He still does. That's well, we're he's, in, got, he's created his habit. I think it's pretty much a habit right now. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, he still does that. And he, 
he has his his routine that I'm trying to make sure that we stick with, kind of accelerating it a little bit because, you know, he did, had all the time in the world before. Didn't matter if he got dressed during the day and sat around in his shorts, which AKA is underwear. Uh-huh. And um, my dad I'm used to call them like, shorts too. That's so funny. Really? Yeah. Okay, so that's a thing. And yeah. then shorts are short pants. That's okay. What I've learned. Okay. Okay. Shorts are underwear. Short pants are shorts. Uh-huh. And then there's pants. Yeah. But I'm like, why? What do you mean shorts? Why do you want to put on shorts? Don't you want to put on underwear first? Oh, okay. Oh. We're learning. Right. We're communicating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that's my story. That's where we're at. And um, for inquiring minds, my mom did stay back in Chico. So my mom is back there and um, my brother, I think, is is helping a little bit with that. So that's where we're at. Okay. Okay. So uh, I have a couple of questions. Can I ask you some questions? Yes, well, absolutely. Not really questions as much as observation. And I, and uh-huh. you, you can elaborate on this as much as you want. So you shared with mm-hmm. me behind the scenes that you and your dad had got to have some conversations like those towards the end of life conversations and, yeah. and having got, you know, as you know, my, both of my parents have passed and I got to have time with both of them and have those conversations. They're hard and they're the best gift that I could have ever gotten ever from them. And mm-hmm. so how was that for you? And what was that like? And what do you want to share about it? We had, let me just say, we had so many conversations that, um, very open and honest conversations, which is just priceless because I, that's why this trip to me, this, the drive road trip was so mm-hmm. important that it was just the two of us and the the phone was on do not disturb. And I needed that time. One thing I talked with my dad about is that people have asked me multiple times because he's been in and out of the hospital countless times and people would say, Hey, you're going to go see your dad. And there was always this little part of me that was like, man, I feel like, a, you know, I'm supposed to be there. Or for a long time, at least I felt that way. Like, no, you know, and I always had to have some reason why. And then I realized my dad and I have had all the conversations. We've talked about everything. know where we're at he said and um he he said those people who rush in that's just out of guilt Mm -hmm. you know just having that real clear communication and I don't have any guilt and I don't think he has any I don't think he has any like regrets or anything and just really having a raw conversation just all out there uh, is priceless you really can't put a price on that, no matter what, I would have done anything to have those moments. And he let me record a lot of them, Mm. which was so good. So he shared stories, yeah, that I'll have forever. And hopefully someday be able to, I'm putting some things together just to have it a little bit more organized. But I have stories that I'll always have because I've always been that one I save like, voicemails on my phone, I'll delete all but like, a few of my dad's or a few of, you know, important people like that. And then um, now I have these recordings. So I encourage anyone who may be in a situation where you have elderly parents or grandparents, if you can, and if they're up for it, having a sit down interview conversation, just asking them to share stories and record it, you'll always have it. And it's just so special. I can't even without even without crying <laughs> tell you how how special it is to me that's, that's a gift that really is a mm-hmm. gift and mm-hmm. so uh 
your mom stayed at home. How, mm -hmm. how was she doing? I don't know. <gasps> my mom is difficult. My mom is challenging and my mom and I do not have a relationship that is healthy. And for me, it's just boundaries. And my mom is welcome to come out to Texas, but we can never live together. And nor did she want to live with my dad any longer. So this worked out. And I hope that she's doing well. I hope that this is everything she wanted and more. And she has that time to do whatever it is that she needs to do or wants to do. Meantime, I'm happy as can be having my dad here with, with us. And um, I wish her, I wish her well. It's such a gift. The daughter father relationship, if it's a good one, you know, I know not all of them are good. Mine was really good with my dad. Yours is really good with your dad. It's, it's such a gift to, to get to just have that time together. I'm, I, I'm, I'm over here. Like I want to eat popcorn and, and sit on the <laughs> sidelines and, and, and be at the movies listening to your, your story, because it's, it just really, it, it makes me emotional because I think about all the conversations I got to have with my dad. And that was, my dad's been gone 21 years and I still miss him so much, so much. And every time I would hug him, I remember hugging him and thinking I might not ever get to hug him again. And just remembering what that, that felt like and, and all those conversations that we got to have. And it, Angie, on the relationship with the mom, <laughs> with your mom, <laughs> I get it. I feel you. Uh, and the sandwich generation that you mentioned in the beginning, I was there. My dad passed away when I was pregnant with Henry 21 years ago. Oh. And then my mom hadn't, my mom didn't know how to put gas in her car. She didn't know how oh, to make God. coffee. Mm -hmm. So I got to have a newborn and three hours away, my mom was trying to navigate her life. And my mom isolates, doesn't have any friends. So it was me. So I was that sandwich generation uh, and right up until she passed. And it, mm. it's, it's, um, it's an, you nailed it. You totally nailed it. It's an opportunity to set boundaries. Otherwise the resentment kicks, kicks in. And, and it, for me, I just got to be really bitter. So once I started setting boundaries, it was, a, it was a lot better. Yeah. Thankfully, I mean, the boundaries with my mom are pretty clear. Uh, there's not much communication that I see happening going forward. Um, and she's in tech. I mean, I'm in Texas, she's in California. So that really kind of prevents me from teaching her how to put gas in her car because, yeah, I know that's going to be some of the things that she gets to face and hopefully she has my brother and whoever else there to help her. Um, and I don't have any guilt around that. And I think that that might be something that people might be like, wow. That sounds so harsh. Years and years and years of being that really good daughter that did all of the things I could do and was there when I could, when I shouldn't have even been there when, you know, like I put other things aside and I, in that situation, just like with my dad, I don't have any guilt around that. And I don't have any guilt around my mom either. It's unfortunate, but just like any other relationship, if it's not healthy for me, I'm not participating in it and I'm done giving all I can possibly give. And I get to say I'm done. And that's not bad. That's not bad for me. That's not bad. And is it for everyone? And can everyone be at peace with that? I don't know. I hope so. I hope that for anyone who's been in a family dynamics like I've been in, at some point, just being able to say, enough. I'm done. I get the permission from God now to say, I'm done. And I'm taking my dad and we're going to go live this life. Or even if it was just me and needed to walk away, I think I'm at it finally at that. No, I know that I'm finally at that place where I can do that. I feel like the burden has finally lifted that I have tried to do all of these things that never were going to be enough, that never were going to be right, that I was doing because I felt I was the daughter that needed to do those things. And I get to let that go now. And that feels good. And I get to focus on the grateful person who said, thank you for being so encouraging, or I appreciate that you're so encouraging. It's a good place to be. I feel like 
relief, Mm -hmm. a lot of relief. I do want to tell you this about my dad. There's always been this story about you'll really know who your true friends are when it's time to move. Because people are like, yeah, no, I've got to, I've got to wash my hair or, you know, whatever. They've got something to do when it comes time to move. Well, when I picked my dad or when my dad and I left the hospital on Friday at 8, drove from Sacramento to Chico, it was a torrential, like, have to pull over, downpour. It was, the weather was so bad. Really? My dad called though. Wow. Oh, it was bad. <laughs> it was so bad. We couldn't see the road and lightning. And it, it was just, it was like an omen. <laughs> like, you know, it's like we're driving into Chico and I'm like, oh my God, we're driving into hell right now. It, because my dad, you know, we didn't know what to expect with the situation. But my dad called some of his friends and the four phone calls he made all four of those people said, well, would you, would you like some help? We'll come over and help tomorrow. They, whatever they were doing, they put it aside and they came to help. And I was like, dad, that really shows your character and how much people love you and care about you that they would walk into not just a move, but a really difficult move. They stayed and they helped. And that to me was just that's kudos to my dad for yeah. being that man that people want to come to and be, be supportive. And they weren't not supportive of my mom. They were, in fact, a couple of them have been over to see my mom, taking my mom to lunch and doing those things. But they didn't just say, mm -mm, we don't want to be involved. They came and they were there. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it because I don't know what that would have been like just doing it myself. Yeah. So I'm grateful and I'm happy and I'm proud that he's my dad and um, I'm looking forward to this time together, whatever that looks like, however long that is. And I hope it's long and it's, you know, and even every moment's just precious. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not going to be easy. Don't think that I realize it's going to be because it hasn't been it already. There's the challenges. There's the, you know, juggling between getting ready myself, getting my dad ready, you know, I have to remember he needs to eat. He needs to have his medicine, medications, his shots, you know. Oh, yeah, you're on battery power. <laughs> that thing. Okay. So do you it's, guys have it's a generator learning. in case your power goes out? We do. Not a, like, the full house one yet, but we will have one before before long. Anyway, so that's my story about this new transition in life. And um, I'm at peace. Well, welcome. Peace. I welcome to this phase of your life. And, and it sounds like you are in a, like you're grounded and accepting. This is where we are. And I love it. I'm grateful. So I, I'm happy Thank that you. I know your dad's in good hands and, and I know you, I know you'll, this time you'll only be grateful for. Yes.